Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the session that is um, climate adaptation and seed transfer. I'm oh, sorry, seed transfer and provenance test analyses. We're going to start off with Fleur Daman. She is a PhD student with David Montue at the University of British Columbia. All right, thanks, Ian. Um, I hope everyone's able to hear me. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this beautiful Thursday. Um, yes, so my name is Fleur. I am a PhD candidate at UBC. I'm working with David Montue. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about my research on the beautiful Douglas fir um, and its uh, climate adaptation to extreme climate events. So perhaps you guys remember from Jennifer Grenz's keynote that at some point she showed a picture of her Gary Oak bulbs that had been really influenced by um, a sudden heat spell and they looked all ill and all warped. Um, and this is actually precisely the kind of event that I'm interested in as well. Um, because it's expected that these kind of events, whether they're extreme heats or extreme droughts or even extreme frosts, um, are going to be increasing in frequency. Um, so this here is a picture of the heat dome of British Columbia from 2021, um, which some of you might or may not remember. Um, and these kind of events are going to be occurring much more in the future. Um, and we need our Douglas fir trees to be resilient and resistant to these kind of events. Um, and because Douglas fir is such an important species for the forest industry in British Columbia, um, my research also has a bit of a silvicultural background or a silvicultural uh, approach. So my question of today is therefore um, th whether or not certain silvicultural interventions, such as planting densities and genetic selection for increased volume in Douglas fir, how they have affected the resilience of trees to extreme climate events. And these involve both extreme heat events and extreme frost events. And the way I'm doing this is I'm looking at a lot of um, tree ring data, so a lot of secondary growth um, from increment cores. And the sites that I'm working on um, are a Douglas fir realized gain trial. And this realized gain trial has five sites, sort of spanning Vancouver Island. So this is Vancouver. And my sites span Vancouver Island and the Sunshine Coast and east of Vancouver. Um, and Generally speaking, these five sites um, have different climates. So we have, for example, my Norish Creek site over here is the coldest, the wettest, and the absolute worst to go to. Um, then we have our Robertson site, which is kind of on the warmer side. And for example, Lang Bay over here is my dry site. Um, and each of these five sites has the same basic layout. So that can be seen here on the right. Um, so we have at these sites four different spacing densities, ranging from a very wide spacing, the 4.0, where the trees are spaced four meters apart, to 2.9, which approximates the operational density for Douglas fir, and to smaller uh, spacing densities, the 2.3 and the 1.6, which are very dense spacings. And then we also have three genetic levels at each of these sites. So we have the wild stand, which is 0% volume gain, and then we have our uh, mid-gain uh, group, which represents 10% um, more volume gain at the age of rotation, and the top cross group, which represents 18% more volume at the age of rotation. Um, so basically, in a nutshell, my research is me wandering off into these realized gain trials, um, bushwhacking my way through various amounts of understory as you go, and, and I take a bunch of increment cores in all of these conditions. Um, and what I then did is I looked at the climates at each of these sites and I identified where um, extreme events have taken place. And then I relate that back to the patterns I see in the tree rings um, from all of my samples. So first things first, um, what happened in the climates at each of these sites? Um, so the first analysis that I did is I looked for extreme heat and extreme drought events at each of my sites. And that's the analysis you can see here in the graph. Um, so on the y-axis, I have my standardized precipitation and evaporation index, which takes into account both um, precipitation and temperature. And any value below an SPEY of minus 1.5 indicates uh, a strong drought. And anything below minus 2.0 indicates a very extreme drought. So you can see that for all of the sites, they did not have a very good time in 2015. That was a year of extreme drought um, in, 
on all of these sites. And then again, we can see in 2021, all these sites also experienced a pretty terrible drought. Um, and then on some of the sites, for example, the Campbell River and the Spirit Lake sites, we also have some events happening in 2018 and 2019. And then also some remnants here in 1998 and 2004. And I should mention that these um, realized gain trials were planted in 1996. So that is kind of the period that we're looking at. And then in addition to extreme drought and extreme heat, I also looked at extreme or at frost events. And the way I did that is I looked at, I calculated for each of the sites at each of the years, the start of the growing season. And I did that as an accumulation of growing degree days. And then after the start of each of these growing seasons, I checked whether or not we had a frost event. Um, so that would be looking at whether or not there was an event that had a temperature of lower than minus 2.2 degrees Celsius. Um, this is the temperature in which we can get some damage in Douglas fir. Um, and so all these events ended up below the sort of the line that I created here. And again, the interesting thing that we can see is that again, 2015 was a year in which on all of the sites, we had one of these spring frost events. So the growing season had already started. And then we had an event um, below minus 2.2 degrees Celsius, which can cause some damage in Douglas fir. Um, so we have our years of interest, um, definitely 2015 as a very interesting year. 2021, maybe some 2018 and 2019. And then my next step was to look at whether or not I also see these events back in the, um, the ring widths of my samples. So I'm gonna take you through the next couple of graphs over here. Um, and in these graphs, I have separated out the effects of spacing density and genetic level. Um, so in, on the x-axis, you can see the progression through the different years. And then on the y-axis, we have basal area increments. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with basal area increments, it's sort of a standardized version of ring widths. Um, and the first three graphs that I've shown here are from the densest spacing. And I should mention that um, the three lines represent the three genetic levels where we have the darkest line is our top cross group and the lightest line is our mid, uh, uh, wild stand group. And as you can see here in this 1.6 spacing density, we do have a little bit of a dip in ring width in 2015 and also in 2021. And the one in 2018, 2019 is not super pronounced here. But if we start adding in more um, spacing density, so this is for example, the 2.3 spacing density, we again see this dip in 2015, in 2021. And if we add more into it, um, we again see this dip becoming more pronounced. We also see a bit of a dip in the 2018. And then if we add in the final one, the um, 4.0 sp spacing density, we can also clearly see a dip in the 2018. And hopefully, um, as you can see, it's kind of a little bit vague, but hopefully you guys can see that um, we actually see a big effect of spacing density on the different ring widths over here. So the effect of spacing density on the secondary growth of the trees is quite pronounced, and we don't actually see any effect of the different genetic levels. So those are not significant. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out is that it's kind of apparent that there's a dip here in 2006. And I think that's mostly due to the fact that 2005, the year before, was a particularly good growing season. Um, but I just wanted to point that out to you guys. Um, so we actually do see, um, in terms of these extreme climate events that we have over the years, we do see these dips in the growing patterns of trees. But the actual core of my research is to look at resistance and resilience and those kind of values. So how well does a tree perform um, before and after certain events? And how well can it recover after an event? Um, so I just wanted to have this slide in there to show you exactly how I'm calculating those indices. So we have our year of interest. In our case, that would be 2015. And each of the, the rings here corresponds to a year. So you can already see that 2015 was a pretty small year um, in this particular core. And we are going to compare the growth in 2015 to the growth before 2015 or after 2015. 
And if we compare the growth in 2015 to the period before, that will give us a value for resistance. If we compare 2015 to the couple of years after, that's gonna give us a value for recovery. And then if we immediately compare the pre-2015 to the post-2015 period, that is gonna give us a measure for resilience. So that is kind of how I calculated my, um, my indices. So in the next couple of graphs, I wanna take you through some of my results that I found, where again, I have um, separated the effects of genetic level. Um, that's what you can see here on the x-axis. So we have our wild stand group, um, our mid-gain group, and our top cross group. And in the different colors, we have the different spacing densities. Um, so from left to right in, within each of the groups, we have our very dense spacing going up to our very wide spacing. And these, this first graph that I wanted to show you is for the resistance, so that's comparing the 2015 period to um, the couple of years before. And hopefully, um, as you can see, is that if you compare the different genetic levels, there is absolutely no influence of those whatsoever. They're performing the same. But then if you look within those groups, it becomes apparent that the 4.0 spacing density, which is our widest density, um, is actually outperforming all the others. So the 4.0 spacing density has higher resistance. Now, if we add in the results for recovery, this pattern disappears completely. So in this case, we don't actually see an effect of the different spacing densities. They're all performing the same. Um, and although it doesn't immediately become clear from these graphs, we actually have our top cross group performing a little bit better than the mid-gain group, but not than the wild stand group. And then if we add in the last graph about the overall resilience, we get a pattern that is, is somewhat resemblant of the resistance values. So we do see the same pattern that the 4.0s are a little bit more resilient than the other spacing densities. And there is again, no effect of genetic level. Um, and because my sites are sort of all over Vancouver Island and the Sunshine Coast, um, I wanted to look whether or not there are also effects of the different sites on these values. So those are the next graphs that I wanted to show you. Um, and in these graphs, I have sort of merged the genetic levels because we really didn't see a big difference between those anyway. Um, so I've merged the genetic levels and instead on the x-axis, you can now see some of my sites. Um, we have the Campbell River site, the Robertson site, and the Spirit Lake site, and those are the three sites from Vancouver Island. Um, I just got back from doing field work on the other two sites, so hopefully in the near future I'll be able to add those as well. Um, but hopefully you can see in this first graph about resistance that um, we do maintain this pattern of the 4.0 spacing density outperforming the others, so they still have higher resistance. But now we also see a big effect of site. So our Robertson site is doing better than the Spirit Lake site in terms of resistance, and the Spirit Lake site does better than the Campbell River site. Now, if you look at recovery, this pattern becomes completely flipped again. So our Robertson site is actually, has actually lower recovery, although it had a lot higher resistance, and the Spirit Lake has higher recovery, um, than you would expect based on the resistance um, values here. And then this culminates into an overall resilience graph where our Spirit Lake site apparently has higher resilience than the Robertson site, and the Robertson site has higher resilience than the Campbell River site, which is very interesting to me because the Spirit Lake site is one of the more marginal sites. It has a pretty strenuous climate. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really interesting find and I hope that if I do add the information from my other two sites, we'll be able to see a pattern there. Um, and yeah, so maybe it's true that the sites that have more marginal climates actually are better at recovery because it doesn't take that much to go back to their original growing patterns just because they've been limited um, in general already. So in conclusion, and I promise this is the only slide I have that has text on it, um, we did see that in, when you're looking at certain climate events that we do see these dips in, uh, in ring widths. And we do see that our variability in yearly growth and our resistance and recovery and resilience values 
are due mostly to sight and spacing effects and that genetics have a lower influence um, because we've seen that there's actually a very large influence of sight on these values. We've seen some benefits of the 4.0 spacing. Um, so that means that only if you are in a very low sp spacing density, you may have a better resistance, you may have better resilience values. And in terms of recovery, we've seen a minor influence, a minor positive benefit of the top cross group, but only marginally. Um, so what does this mean in terms of silvicultural interventions? And these results are very preliminary. Um, but so far, I have found no indication that we cannot safely use top cross trees. Um, they don't seem to have lower resistance or resilience um, to climate events. Um, and in addition, um, just in case anyone was wondering about whether or not we can use um, spacing density to increase the resilience, maybe, but I think you would have to do like a big decrease in planting density because we've seen that only the 4.0s have beneficial effects compared to the other um, densities. So you would have to decrease the density by quite a bit if you want to increase the resilience and resistance in your plots. And yeah, so before I go to my acknowledgement slides, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what I'm gonna be working on in the future. Um, because as you all understand, my research is pretty much in retrospect. I'm looking at past climates, I'm looking at past um, growth in trees. And I think in this sort of this era of increasing climate variability and increasing you know, extreme events, um, I think it's more important to start looking at how you can detect drought stress on a better temporal scale. Um, so yeah, I'm exploring collaborations with the remote sensing uh, group at UBC to see if we can use multispectral values um, and sort of a digital photo photography to detect individual trees, to look at drought stress in individual trees and then be able to make management decisions based on that. And then, yeah, so for my last slide, I would like to thank all my supervisors and everyone who has provided input to this project, everyone who was involved in the Realized Gain trial in some way, and a special shout out to all my students who had to come into the field with me and battle all the understory with me, and they are absolute troopers. And yes, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Blue. Who is going to start us off? Tom. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so all my results that I presented here today were the, well, the 2015 year, yes, yeah, yeah. So I noticed that yes, that's yes, at the end of the graph, that's the uh, Um, I, yeah, I understand what you mean. Um, I think so, yeah. Um, at the same time, that is kind of where my data ends as well. So I, I sampled most of my sites in 2022. I did some in 2023. Um, so it is kind of the end of my data. Um, so for the 2021 event, I won't be able to calculate any recovery values um, because the, the period I'm using before and after the event is quite arbitrary. Some people use four years before, four years after. Um, I think in my research that is kind of difficult because we had a couple of events very close to each other. We had 2015. Definitely something in 2018 and then again something in 2021. So I've been comparing different sort of uh, periods. Um, I've tried two years, three years, four years. Um, I find that they're sort of giving me the same result, but for the 21 event, I won't be able to, cal to calculate any recovery values. Yeah. Yes. Well, that is actually, um, yeah. That is something that I've been thinking about. Um, some of the hypotheses that I've been working with is that, for example, when you're looking at frost events, you could hypothesize that a, a denser spacing might provide some protection and that trees in denser spacing might actually do better. Um, I haven't been, it's really difficult to separate those effects. For example, in 2015, we had both a, a frost event happening as well as a drought event. So I don't know how to separate those effects. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely something interesting to look at, yeah. 
Is it very quick, Sean? Yes. But you might imagine that recovery could take like longer. So have you looked at the year even farther, like 2017, 2018, as your recovery reference? Y yes. So um, that's what I was trying to explain as well. Um, there are there's not really a consensus on the period to use for resistance or recovery. Um, so, so some people have been using five or six years, four years, two years. I've seen everything in the literature. Um, the reason that I chose to do a, a pretty short period is because I had so many events following each other um, in my data. Um, I find that they're sort of giving me the same result. Yeah. Okay, let's give Fleur a good big hand. Thank you very much, Fleur. <laughs> Our next presenter is Zi Hao Hang, and she is from the University of Alberta. She's a PhD student with Andreas Hammann. Oh, I already graduated. <laughs> oh. Sorry, she already graduated. No. So what was it? Oh. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. a surprise because I never saw so many people will just come to this session but welcome and today's my presentation is about a system migration and try to quantify uh, quantify the frost risk that may cause by it and this is a project that I finished in my PhD so that was a little bit like over a year ago but hopefully it's still something like we can start a conversation and try to not only look at genetic increase, but also look at some potential risk as well. Next. Sorry. Oh, okay. So the background, very old story, that's climate change happening. And what happened is climate maladaptation. And based on the idea of the climatic and plant interaction, there's always one specific climate optimal value. But because the climate changes, which warm me up, which certainly makes, um, introduce the mitre adaptation for the edge population, which increase the fire and beetle intact. But for the northern region, because the climate, the optimal just moved to the north, but the population for trees, they cannot move that far or not that fast. So that's why a system migration was suggested as one potential solution to mitigate such um, changes about, about climate. And depends on where you are, so current suggestion either can be GBST or CBST, and consider the future planting site should be around roughly two degree colder than the seeds come from, or the climate the seeds are original adapted to. And which means either you can select the seeds and move them to the northern region, which roughly around 145 kilometer, which represent like one degree decrease, or to the higher elevation. So just move to the higher uh, increase elevation for nearly 200 meters. And this acid migration is particularly useful once we have population differentiation for certain trait. So besides to mitigate climate change. So assistant migration can also give us better chance to select better seed source for the future. So we can do genetic, impro genetic improvement and select where the seed source would have the best performance. 
But what I want to mention, or what I want to do in this study, is to analyze, so besides potential improvement, so how about potential risk? So is that possible that when we move the seeds to the colder region, then they would be exposed to potential frost risk? or they would suffer from more frost damage. Since, oh sorry. Since seed source from different climate and tree, ph tree ph uh, phenology are cl closely climatic adapted, which increase, which changes, which different their timing of bud break, and which potentially give them some frost risk, after a, uh, after a system migration to colder regions. And for different regions, depends on where the seeds come from, then they may have slightly different response to climatic signals. So for example, at the same time, when they test about frost risk, and then they have very different cold hardness, so which, which means we certainly need to take care if we just move to from uh, the seed source from south to north, if they don't really prepare to start the winter yet. But that is most like the idea before I look at the data. So the study question is, so if we just apply a system migration to either go to north or to higher elevation, with using two degree decrease of mean annual temperature. So is that really gonna change the frost risk? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. And is there any difference between these two methods? And this study, um, I use the, I focus about both BC and Alberta, which have quite diverse climate combinations and to estimate what's the potential risk of frost, so we need to figure out, to estimate when is the time for to bud break or bud set. And for bud break, which mostly triggered by temperature, to be more specific, is thermal accumulation. And in this study, we can estimate, so growing degree days, and for example, we can in, so firstly, we define 30 days after growing degree days reaching 100 and, sp sp and define it as late spring. And similarly, we just set a value so it's just easier for us to compare. So 30 days before the fall equinox as early fall, so which give us some kind of idea, so given the similar environmental signal, how the climate climate different. So be, now um, in this study, we do need to have high resolution uh, climate data. So what we use is, so DMAT, so which can give us one kilometer resolution daily climate um, from 1980. And then with one kilometer resolution, and then as look at daily record from the last 39 years. So here's just generally how the day, daily climate looks like. Yeah, it's um, it's boring CSV file, I know. So um, so we can have daily minima and maximum temperature. So the, min the minimum temperature is low enough, then it suggests potential frost. And so we can, so the first step is to identify the which day, that's for each single pixel, that they reach the growing degree of 100. So that's the, the threshold that we set for potential bad break. And then we look at 30 days record after that and identify what's the lowest value that we had for the last 39 years. 
and based on the historical record that we can summarize about potential um, minimal, like the probability of daily, daily temperature below negative five. And we assume after bad break, the negative five should bring some damage to, to young seedlings. And so we go through the whole BC and Alberta. So both for the early spring, uh, so late spring and early fall, and what we find out is, so the color represents the probability of a daily temperature below negative five, and the color, um, the darker color represents higher frost risk. And even there's not really um, identical, but for the late spring, then the high frost risk region are normally in high elevation. Well, similarly for late fall, even for the fall season that um, the region may, um, there's quite region influenced by frost risk, especially in BC. Well, to better just to compare between different regions that we can just aggregate by different seed zones. Um, so just by four dominant commercial tree species, and we just com compare what does the average the general frost risk per region. And uh, what we still use the seed zone because generally they have very similar environment and they normally have very consistent climate in general. Um, I mean, within the region. So here's just some very simple comparison. For example, oh, sorry. So if we just move within the same region, but from lower elevation to higher elevation, which roughly with two degree difference about mean annual temperature, but we, if we just compare the frost risk that we calculated, then there's quite signif significant increase. And that pattern may not really 100%, but it certainly covers the most combinations and, but if we look at the movement, so from the southern region to the, north, to the northern area, but with similar elevation, so the, the decrease of mean annual temperature is still around two degree, but the frost risk changes are pretty minimal. So to realize it, so at the, at the spring frost risk, then if we to just latitude, so from the southern to the north, then actually the frost rates are generally pretty low and there's no big changes. So which is roughly the tail here. But if we just move to higher elevation, then higher elevation area, they certainly have much increased risk and also there's higher variation of of frost of temperature in higher elevation elevated region. So similar pattern that we can also find for early fall frost risk. All right. To summarize, so so mitigate from southern to north seems a better like a safe option. But if we just move from lower to higher elevation, then we may to consider the potential changes of frost risk. And the other thing is for, so what causes is the elevated region tend to have high variation of temperature, even in short time period. So we take, we define the frost risk as by certain time period at um, this, so for example, growing degree days of 100 and five degree. It's, uh, it's arbitrary, but we also use different combinations. So for example, did 200, 300, and using different threshold for, um, for minimum temperature. But the result is very similar. So which suggests, so even at the similar situation that the frost rate is still higher 
in general for, for elevated region. And um, if you want to know a little bit more details, then you can check the paper. So, but in the study that we only look at the climate and uh, from the last 40 years, but we didn't really consider, so for example, genetic and different population response. And we certainly do need some field measurement so we can compare and to verify whether frost risk can be a real damage or real uh, concern. So take home message that we do need, like we still need assistant migration, but we certainly need some more detail for, um, and suggestions for it, which means besides mean annual temperature and mean annual precipitation, we still need to look at climate variability and especially extreme values. All right. If you have any questions, let me know. Maybe, but um, extreme temperature is kind of very, you know, regional specific. But it seems like at least for the eastern region, that seems is what we found. But for other region, I recommend you just to double check. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll move on to our next speaker. Okay. Thank you. Next speaker is Claudio Mura. He is from the University of Quebec and he's a PhD student. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the presentation. Uh, as Ian said, I'm from the University of Quebec in Chicoutimi. I included the map here because it's pretty far away and I suppose not everybody knows where it is. Uh, Chicoutimi is on the ancestral land of the Innu people uh, of Quebec, which were among the first First Nations which came in contact with the French when once they started entering the mouth of the St. Lawrence. The title of my presentation is The Early Bud Gets the Cold, Spring Phenology Drives Exposure to Late Frost. And perfect. So I'll start by introducing the different strategies that trees use to survive the cold winters, especially here in Canada. Um, so you see here a generic graph of the temperature over winter. And the first strategy is frost avoidance, which consists in protecting the growing tissues by entering a dormant state, and in some cases, like the bud, by forming specific structures uh, to protect the meristems from the cold. The second strategy is frost tolerance, which consists in increasing frost tardiness in the overwintering organs. And these two strategies are concurrent, so they're not mutually exclusive, they are uh, happening together. And if we focus here on the time of bud break, uh, we see that it is a particularly critical period because uh, here the, um, the new shoots are coming out and the young growing tissue is particularly sensitive to frost because it has a very high water content. So what can happen in this uh, specific time during bud break, uh, we see here, for example, is a false spring event followed by a late frost. So at the start of the spring, we have a very marked spike in temperature. And in response to this, the buds uh, start to break and the young shoots are out. So when the uh, sub-zero temperatures come back, we can have uh, tissue damage and death of the organs. So this is essentially a failure in frost avoidance and it shows the importance of the synchronization between the tree phenology and the actual temperatures. Now the problem is that climate change can disrupt this balance in two ways. The first one is that by increasing the uh, spring temperatures, we are seeing an advance in the bud break timings. 
And the second one is that by increasing the uh, frequency of extreme events and generally by increasing the variability in spring temperatures, we are seeing in some regions more likely late frost. So the question that we ask in this context is that if there are intraspecific differences in the phenology, so if there are different timings of bud break within the same species, does this mean that there are different vulnerabilities to late frost? So to answer this question, we looked at the natural fr late frost event, which took place in spring 2021 in a black spruce common garden. So you see here our five provenances, which are the yellow diamonds, and these are all natural stands, so there is no genetic selection whatsoever going on here. Uh, we just went into the forest, collected the seeds, and we planted them all in the southernmost site here. And we planted the common garden in 2014, and it, counts, uh, it counted 371 trees in 2021 when the late frost happened. Um, so for the data that we used, we had weather and climate data, weather for 2021, and as a reference, we took the 1990 to 2020 period. I decided to take this 30-year interval because I wanted it to be as close as possible to actual climate change conditions, let's say. And we, uh, we also had uh, six years of bad break measurements from 2015 to 2021. Uh, I say six years, even though it's seven, because in 2016 we had some logistical problems and nobody was able to go to the field. So we are missing one year in this interval. But uh, what we did in these six years is that every week during the season, we went to the field and we measured the phenology with the uh, ordinal stages from zero to six, which you see here. Zero is the close bud, six is the completely broken bud with exposed shoot. And we did this each week on each apical bud of each tree in the common garden. And for the first damages after the first event, what we did was identify this uh, brown and dead bud, and we counted the proportion of dead buds on each tree. And we established an ordinal, uh, or an ordinal scale from zero to three, where zero is no damage bud on the trees, and three is the maximum am amount of damage, which in our case was between 15 and 30% of the buds. So we get to the results. Uh, first of all, the phenology that we measured in the six years. So here on the x-axis, you have uh, the phenological stages I just discussed. Uh, so one is closed bud, and sixth is uh, completely broken bud. And here you have our five provenances. Colder colors indicate provenances from colder climates here. And here you have the mean day of the year in which each provenance reached a certain phenological stage. So what we see here is that for all six years of, of observation, the provenances from the colder climates were faster in their bud break, or, that, or rather earlier in their bud break. And this was very consistent on the six years, and there's already a bunch of publications from my lab which go more in detail into this particular aspect, which points to ecotypic differentiation in black spruce. So I will leave it at this for the moment. And for the environmental conditions, here you have snow cover in the top, growing degree days, and minimum temperatures. And the blue line are the conditions for 2021. And the light blue shaded area are the conditions for the 30 year period of reference. So what we saw was a very low uh, snow cover. Um, for example, on, uh, in this point, which was the highest in 2021, it was uh, in the lowest portion compared to the 30 year period. And also, uh, the snow disappeared 20 days earlier than the average. And by looking at the growing degree days, it's easy to see why. Uh, again, this is just before the frost. I forgot to mention that these two dashed lines are the two days in which we had uh, sub-zero temperatures. And uh, just before the frost event, the growing degree days were up to 326, while the average for the 1990-2020 period, I forgot the zero, um, is uh, 194. Now, for the temperature trend, what we saw is a spike in temperature just one week before the frost with minimum temperatures reaching uh, 16 degrees uh, positive, which is very high temperature for this time of the year for this area. and. The first event happened on 28th and 29th of May, 2021, 
and the minimum recorded temperature was minus 1.9 degrees. So we get to the juicy part. And on the top, you see the first damages uh, or the repartition of first damages in our provenances. So here again, you have the five provenances. Uh, on the right, you have the ones from the north and from the colder places. On the left, you have the ones from the south and the warmest places. So you see here, um, again, zero means no damage and three is the maximum amount of damage. So here, the darkest color indicates more first damage. And you see that uh, well, frost occurrence was different between the provenances and provenances from the colder climates at, um, yeah, sorry, I'm jumping, uh, I'm jumping ahead. And that provenances from the colder climates had more frost damage. And also, you see here, uh, here the darkest colors indicate more advanced, advanced stages of bad break. And so the provenances from the colder climates also had more advanced bad break, and uh, that resulted in more damages. We ran an ordinary regression to predict the first damage based on, on the bad break phases, and that confirmed the rel relation between the two. And so what we get from all of this is that an earlier bad break of the colder provenances left them exposed to late frost. So to conclude, um, our study shows, based on field data, that the synchronization between the phenology and the environment can lead to uh, damage and organ death, even on black spruce, which is a very frost hardy species, even at relatively mild temperatures of m minus uh, 1.9 degrees. And also, uh, we show that differences in bud break phenology suggest an ecotypic differentiation in black spruce and they were also very constant on the six years of observations. And finally, the provenances from the colder sites react earlier to warm spring, warm spring temperatures and have a higher risk of late frost damage. Um, so based on our results, uh, what we can recommend is that provenance selection can be applied to reduce the late frost risk, at least for the black spruce, because we are seeing a very clear trend in the provenances. And as a final note here, I only talked about uh, late frost in springtime, but there are other factors to consider, such as the early frost in the autumn. So we are seeing a trade-off because the provenances that start earlier also finish the season earlier. So they are more at risk from late frost, but less from early frost. And finally, of course, we also need to quantify the differences in winter frost tardiness in these provenances to check if they uh, can survive the winter. For example, if we want to do a system migration to the north. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Claudio. Lots of time for questions. Who's gonna go first? Uh, yes and no, because black spruce, I will define it as a pretty conservative species. It has a very short growing season and it doesn't adjust a lot. And the fact that it doesn't adjust can be a problem with climate change because here, of course, we have like a, a southern transfer of the... Let me go back a bit. Yeah, we have a southern transfer of the uh, species and we didn't see any kind of uh, adaptation over time. So we expected at some point, or we tried to see if there was, um, like if the northern provinces were becoming more and more similar to the others in terms of bad break, but they didn't. And also uh, there is a colleague that is working on a new paper that is uh, looking at the growth the year following the late frost, and we don't see any kind of difference. They still do their bad break earlier and uh, their growth was reduced by the late frost. So if the temperatures uh, go up in the north, it could be a problem for those areas. Okay, I'm gonna go to Sally next. Sorry, Sally next. You can go, then, and then you. Sally. 
Uh, yeah, not a lot in this study because, of course, with chilling, it's a bit difficult, especially in these areas where you have temperatures in the winter of minus 10, minus 20, minus 30, because we don't really know what's going on with chilling. But uh, from my perspective, I think, uh, well, the winters are really, really cold there, so if there was an effect of chilling of the northern provinces when we move them south, I would expect this to delay the bad break and not anticipate it. So I think it's really a difference in forcing. And I did look, uh, there is some a part of the paper which talks about uh, forcing a little bit better. And what I saw is that it's really a difference in the amount of forcing and not in the sensitivity. So I tried to use different uh, GDD to compute the forcing. And I saw that for all of the provenances, the, there was the same base GDD. Um, Exactly, exactly. So why not, uh, you know, add four for each fault of, I don't know, one uh, to five? Well, we didn't look at all of the buds one by one. We just went into the field and we took actually a, a full day to establish the methodology because we weren't really sure at the beginning how to do it. What we did was uh, find model trees. So we say this is uh, a stage well, zero is easy because there is no damage, but stage one was uh, around less than 5% of the buds damaged. And then the stage two was between five and 15, and the stage three was between 15 and 30. So we went in the field, we took a few trees and said, okay, this is stage one, stage two, and stage three, and we used them to kind of parameterize or get an eye for the measurement for all of the plantation. And if that helps answer the question, we didn't see any kind of recovery on the damaged bud. So we kept going in the field for uh, the bud break assessment and also bud set assessment. So we were there every week the whole season and we never saw any recovery of the brown buds. So all of the brown ones were dead. So they were, yeah, that, that's really what we observed that's either dead or not. We didn't see any partial damage. We didn't see any bud with a few brown uh, needles uh, and the rest uh, intact. Last question. I think Mr. Lassen Benomar was earlier. Yeah, and an important point is also that our conditions were very particular in that the temperature was really kind of mild. Because normally in the literature, you don't see damages on this kind of Nordic spruce species uh, above minus three. And I think it's an interesting part of the paper that it shows that if it's in the right moment, uh, even a temperature of around minus two can be lethal even for this kind of uh, hardy species. Of course, it's never all of the buds because they have variation in the phenology of the buds in, in the single tree, but. 
Okay, thank you very much. That concludes the session. If we can make our way back to the main room for the next keynote.